some stuff that's also in there in terms of the um, some Twitter data we'll be pulling, and I'll have a whole talk about the Twitter data and some recommendations about that. And I'm also going to show you some different ways of extracting some of this data too within this. Um, so this is going to be assuming a prior experience with the R. If you're not familiar with R, that's okay. Uh, you're still welcome to hang out and learn this. Um, I would recommend then going and kind of just uh, checking out the the intro that we have on our website too. So what we're going to do first is kind of the, uh, for the structure today, I'm going to show you, talk about, well, what is uh, text mining? We're going to talk about the ways to go about doing this, how to collect some of the data, how to put that into the system, and then how to clean it up and how to do some basic type of analyses. Um, we are going to be recording this. So if you're trying to open R and have all this at the same time, um, if that gets overwhelming, focus on the video and then uh, we'll be sending out the URL or there's the URL right there. We'll be also sending out the recording later on too. So if you're interested, that way you can kind of watch it later on, try things. And if you want to get stuck on things, send me an email, let me know. And always happy to kind of talk through things. Uh, so before all of that, if I had to mention, my name is Eric Schuler. I'm a quantitative, I do quantitative and computational methodology at CTRL. Um, I'm an experimental psychologist by training, and I mostly do simulation work personally for my own research. Um, so I really do not do text mining. Uh, it's not part of my personal research area. Uh, I know enough of it to be dangerous, but so I kind of, I'm going to give you kind of the basics of this from my understanding. Uh, so again, full disclosure, I'm not an expert in text mining, uh, but I'm going to show you kind of what I know, and we'll go from there. Let me go ahead and just drop this tiny wall in here one more time. Um, see a question about sending a recording link. Uh, so there will be, um, in terms of the recording link, I'd have to double check, but it, there's going to be a, on the CTRL website, uh, the link to the recording. Um, so if you can send me an email, I'm going to go ahead and put my email into the chat. If you're interested in the recording afterwards, uh, send me an email. And as soon as it's been added to the YouTube channel, I'll send it over to you we'll, as well with the link to the tiny URL. That way you have everything. Just send me an email and I'll get that back to you. Uh, Give it like a, a week or two, just in terms of getting it up there, processed and all that. But send me an email as soon as you can, or whenever you remember, and I'll put it in the queue and get that to you when I'm able to. So, oh, um, so I'm seeing folks, um, rather than put your email in the chat, please email me directly um, if you want the URL, rather than put your email in the chat, because I might not be able to, might not remember to pull that before we end the session today. Um, so that tiny roll, that's going to redirect you to all this information, and we'll be using most of this for today, except for the HTML and some of the these ones here. Um, so let me go ahead and open up the script, and actually let me go ahead and change this a little bit. Um, I prefer using uh, dark mode for coding, it just helps my eyes a lot, but for things like sessions like this, it's not as helpful. So let me go ahead and move that out of the way. There we go, that's better. So let me clear this out. I was just rerunning everything, making sure it runs correctly. Um, so if you were at the one I did a couple, like I think a year or so ago with this, it's similar information, but it's been updated here and there. Um, so the big thing is how to work with text data. We'll be talking about how to extract it, how to look at word frequencies, generate a word cloud, run sentiment analysis, so how positive or negative that text is, and then run topic modeling. Again, this is assuming prior experience with R. So if you're not familiar with the R, uh, you'll want to check out the other videos that we have. So for learning outcomes, uh, recognize the steps to import textual data into R or Studio. Um, so you can walk away knowing how to do that. You'll be able to describe the steps that you need to take for cleaning textual data. You're also going to learn how to be able to explain the differences of looking at text data based on the research questions. So if you're looking at how positive or negative a text is, well, that's going to be a sentiment analysis. If you're looking for underlying topics or themes, that's going to be topic modeling. Uh, so kind of depending on what you're going to do, when we're talking research questions, there's different approaches you'll need to take. Um, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead, even before we do this, I'm going to show you how I got some of the data. Um, I'm not going to show you how to get the Twitter data because I'm actually going to jump the gun a little bit with this. Uh, for Twitter, or X as it's called now, 
they have changed how the API works. So we are going to be potentially analyzing some Twitter data towards the end if there's time and if there's interest. However, to actually scrape the Twitter data using R, you actually have, a, have to have a paid account. Um, I do not have a paid account. And so kind of that doesn't really work. So I have some archival or Twitter data I had scraped a couple of years ago. We'll be using that as an example. So if you wanted to do uh, doing any sort of text mining with Twitter, you will have to pay for the data. Um, they used to have an academic level where if you're an academic, you got you got free range of it, but they've reduced that. And there's also potential issues of the, well, those who, since the great Twitter migration, uh, have left Twitter. So there's going to be also bias in terms of the sample and those who's actually on there versus not on there. So there's a bunch of methodological concerns you really need to think through if you're using X as a platform for tweets and kind of scraping that. Um, I'm going to go walk through how to, how to clean that once if you have the data, but I'm not going to be able to show you how to get that data because um, it's not as easy to get anymore and you have to pay for it. So I just want to put that word of caution on there really quick. So for getting the data, we'll be using a couple of different ones. I went ahead and I created a, a fake uh, data set, and that's going to be as if you had a, a survey on Qualtrics and you downloaded the data. So I have that. And we'll be pulling that. We're also going to be pulling a lot of text data as well. So just kind of show you what the text data looks like. It's a transcript. Um, I am a big Call of Cthulhu fan. I love the tabletop game. Um, love Dungeons and Dragons. So we'll be using kind of that type of information because it's what I like. So I'm sorry, I'm on a, a draggy kid and streaming with me into the world of Cthulhu. So this is the data I went ahead and scraped within this. And I'm going to show you actually how I went about doing this, if you wanted to do this on YouTube. So this is Shadows of the Crystal Palace. If you're a Call of Cthulhu fan, a Critical Role fan, highly recommend it. It is great. It's fun. Um, and it's just all the good stuff. So the nice thing within this is on YouTube, some videos, if you scroll down, they'll supply a transcript. So we can actually get that transcript. And sometimes it will have the timestamps. What we can then do is we can toggle the timestamps, and then that way we don't have it. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead, and it takes a little bit of time, but pretty much highlight and snag the entire transcript. And then I copy that, and I put it into Notepad. That is quite literally what I did to be able to get uh, the Shadows of the Crystal Palace, this entire transcript. That's this. I did the same thing for another Call of Cthulhu live play. That was Edge of Darkness. Um, so I did that same thing and I put this in as a PDF. That way, as an example of pulling in data, that's a PDF. Now this one doesn't have like who is speaking within this. So that's going to be a layer when we go ahead and when we do the data cleaning, we're going to process that. But it's, it's the full transcript and that's how I got it from YouTube. There are things like the that the CSV and the SAV file, that's just a fake data or Qualtrics uh, survey I made. And it looks kind of like this. So this is fake. I had it just go in there, fit, make some fake data. And then that way we can analyze it and pull it in there too. Um, so that's how we got all this different data within this. Um, the, the critical role data, which is the Twitter data or X data now, that... Um, so I'm not able to share that code anymore, how to scrape it, because it doesn't work. I spent more time than I'd like to say trying to make it work in preparation for this. But without having that paid account, it won't work. So I'm, I'm not going to show you how to do that. Um, if you have a paid account, happy to kind of talk through that. But it, things have changed in terms of the API setup. So it's, it's going to be a little bit tricky to set that up. Uh, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to get our session ready. I always like to do, um, because of the data set, when you download everything, put it in the same directory. That way, it's going to be easier to figure out where everything's working out of. Um, I don't do set working directory as a code here because my path setup is going to be different than your path setup. So if you're putting it all in the same bin, just go to set session, set working directory, and go to source file. And that's going to put tell R where everything is. And if I go to files, I see all my good stuff in there that I can then have fun with. Um, this is just setting up all the code or all the packages that we'll need for today. Um, it goes ahead and it screens your RStudio session, see if you have everything installed. If not, it installs it. 
and it gets rid of scientific notation. I hate scientific notation. Um, and then we're just going to load the packages for today. So we're going to use a bunch of different ones. And we're going to kind of use it in combination to do everything we're going to need to do. Um, so as we're going, um, if you have questions, go ahead and put it in the chat. I'm going to be looking over. I have another screen set up. So I'll be looking at the chat uh, when I can um, and then going from there. Um, so this, I'm not going to worry about for real. Just using that just for the um, for importing data. So it's giving that warning, but it, it's not a big deal. So don't worry about it. So for text mining, the idea is that you're going to be able to gather meaningful information from large amounts of data, collections of text data. Uh, so it may be structured, it may not be structured. It's going to use NLP or natural language processing to just try to look at, well, how positive, what's the positive valence, what's the negative valence in terms of sentiment of the text. It really depends on the lexicon you're using. So there's different dictionaries you can use that has like kind of essentially different lists of specific keywords that will skim through and be like, okay, is this a positive word? Is this a negative word? And so forth. And then from there, we can also then determine, are there underlying topics within this? Now, this is going to be exploratory in nature. Um, I am of the firm believer that it is critical to read through the text prior to processing it. You want to make sure it makes sense. You need to know the potential issues for cleaning within this. You really, you can't just take text data, throw it in here, and expect it to magically make uh, good results out of really bad data. If you have bad data, so think of it this way. You have garbage data in, garbage data out. So your results are only going to be good as your data. You can throw all fancy statistical analyses at it and different processes at it. But if your data is crap, you're going to have crap results. So please, please, please make sure you always take the time to read through the text. Um, so I, I always recommend that because, again, garbage in, garbage out. The NLP that this is using, it's going to be kind of basic. We're not using any sort of AI within this. Um, and I would argue it's not better than manually qualitatively coding the materials. You're letting the algorithm determine what a topic is for you. Um, does the algorithm know the theory that you're using? No. Does it know how to understand different things in terms of double negatives, um, maybe sarcasm within a statement? Maybe not. So there's also words can have different meanings, multiple meanings be taken out of context for text mining. So please use extreme caution. You always make sure you want to read these ahead of time and just give it a sanity check. Um, the too long didn't read part, don't let the algorithm make important decisions in the place of researcher knowledge, your expertise, and your theory. Um, I always, always mention this. Again, I'm not, my expertise is not in text mining, but please, you know the research area, you know the expertise, you have the research expertise, you know the theory, you have the knowledge. Use that. Don't let a computer program do it on your behalf. Um, this is my two cents within this. So when you shouldn't use text mining, uh, if you have really small sample sizes or if you have an evasion of privacy. So if you're ex examining public posts on X, that could be a fair game. If it's private messages or posts on social media forums, like Mastodon specifically, Mastodon, um, there's actually things that you're not supposed to use, user data and privacy is expected. So you don't want to violate those expectations. Data should be gathered with consent when possible. If it's public facing data, that could be okay, but always go on the side of caution within this. And please use be ethical and responsible when collecting and analyzing social media content. Um, if it's a closed forum that you're scraping without letting anyone know, uh, that could be an issue. Uh, so I just want to say that. Um, so again, be ethical, be considerate, uh, and just kind of think through these as well. So when we're looking at text data, we're going to go through a couple of different examples. We're going to go through an example where we have a survey data that could be a mixed methods approach. So we have our quant data. We're not going to analyze that, but we have some, some open-ended responses. We're going to analyze that. We can take a look at it. We're going to pull in text from a TXT file. Uh, it could also be a PDF as well. So um, we can pull that text as a transcript and code that. Um, then optional if time. Uh, we can we can look at some X data, some some tweets. Um, so here's the note about the API. I spent hours trying to make this work. I really spent a lot of time working on it. 
I tried everything. I tried um, some different ways about going, some bypass ways to bypass it. Nothing worked. So if you have the data, I'm gonna show you how to work with it, but scraping that, that's a whole nother issue. So now that I've went off on a huge tangent about this, let's actually start pulling in some data and I'll walk you through the steps of how to clean this. Uh, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna pull in the text mining of the CSV. So this is our CSV data. We have, this is our survey data. So we have our Qualtrics stuff here. And yeah, it's problematic. I, I didn't clean this well at first, but this is intentional. So whenever you download Qualtrics data as a CSV, the first one is gonna be your headers, but then you have these two additional headers. We need to remove those first. And so what we're gonna do is remove the metadata that's not part of the actual data frame. So now that we've removed that metadata, that looks better. So our first row to begin with is actually going to be a response. So this one was a fake uh, survey I did that asks what is your favorite tabletop game and explained why that game. And that's kind of, because this was a tester, it's all just Latin. So we're not gonna be able to make much sense of it, but that way you can kind of get, envision this, if you're doing a study that has a closed ended response set, like a choose one of the following, that'd be your Q1. If you have an open ended response, that's gonna be your Q2, just in terms of the data structure. Um, we can also do the same thing, oh shoot, yeah. So what's your favorite tabletop role playing game? And then why, and then we piped that answer into a why is that your favorite? I, this is fake data. I simulated a thousand big responses. Again, completely fake. And so we do that. And I'm just going to go ahead and just grab our close end response, so Q1 and Q2, and that's now our data frame. So we have that, and that looks pretty good. We can then turn this to a factor of all well, and call this well what the game, and then the why. With them. So I'm just doing some basic, basic data cleaning. Now, because game is a closed factor, we can then figure out, well, how many people said they, what's their favorite of the list, that that's their favorite game. So I'm gonna run the table function from janitor. I'm storing that as an object called tab. Now, when I do that, it's gonna give me just the frequency table of which game. So we have Call of Cthulhu, that was 24%. Dungeons and Dragons was 23%. Other, and then we have Pathfinder. Um, and then we can get, okay, well, what that looks like. Um, and then we can go ahead and we can create a box plot for all these. Um, word of caution, I'm one of those folks who hates pie charts, so please never use pie charts. I believe they are a useless abomination for data visualization. Um, they are absolutely useless. Um, you can quote me on that. Um, I do not like them. Um, so we can use a histogram instead. So we're gonna use a, the bar plot from this, and I'm saying, well, for the names, and I'm giving the specific names of each of the tabletop game, giving the X the access a name, giving the Y access a name because there's frequencies, and giving it a title. And now we have something that's a little bit more readable. What's our frequency for each of these games? Uh, this is going to be the same process. Like, let's say you download this survey that has open end and closed end responses, but as an SPSS file, let's say .sav file. Well, it's the same thing. We're going to import that data and take a look at it. Now, we don't have to, with the SPSS, we don't have to worry about the metadata columns as a CSV. So it doesn't have those additional rows here. But we can then see, okay, it's the same exact data, but we have one, two, three, four here. So we just have to code that. So we go ahead and put the code, one, two, three, four, because that's the specific ordering within Qualtrics. And we do the same thing. So we get our frequencies, and we're good to go. So from there, we then start processing the text data. Um, we're not going to do that because that's in Latin, and it's all gibberish because it's just random simulated data. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to shift gears. We're going to switch to importing a TXT file and a PDF as transcripts. And I'm going to walk you through how to import that and how to clean that textual data. And then the same principles are used within that you would use on the survey data or on Twitter data. It's the same process. Um, so a lot of times you'll see text stored as a TXT file for transcripts. It's really common. And if you have multiple TXT files, you can actually combine them with the metadata, so like the file name, the source of the data, year, 
for additional analytics. We're actually going to do that for this. Uh, so for this one, I went ahead and extracted some YouTube videos I like for Call of Cthulhu. Um, so there's the links to these. If you're interested, go ahead and have some fun with that. And I walk through like the steps I just showed earlier for how did I get those transcripts. And it's just kind of pulling it, copy, paste. I didn't use any underlying code to scrape it. I literally just clicked on it and highlighted and copied it. So from here, we're going to read the Crystal Palace TXT file in there. And that's SCP. So looking here, we have our document ID information. And then we have the entire transcript. It only gives you a little fragment of it here, but it's the entire transcript. If you printed it out, I think it's like 60 pages long. Uh, don't print it out. That saves the environment. Don't print it. But it is quite long, but I'd recommend kind of going through and just give it a quick check. So even though we just imported it, I would go through this. I'd open up the file. And let me pull it here. And I'd give it a quick check and see what it looks like and get a sense, okay, what are going to be some issues here? So I can see because they actually, they went ahead and they manually put in the entire transcript rather than um, having it auto transcribe. We can see here they've had each of the speaker in what the speaker said. Well, we're going to probably want to remove that. Um, we're going to have to remove any sort of special characters. It's kind of just looking at it and getting sense, okay, what's in here? We see uh, some music symbols because we have a static crackle and then there's music playing. Um, so this was actually really done well uh, in terms of the transcription, but we're going to have to take some additional steps then to clean this up. So always kind of give it a read through, give it a once over. That way you know what you're going to end up having to deal with. So once we've imported that, we also have, let's say we have a PDF doc. And this is another common approach, like you have a bunch of PDFs that you want to scan in and then run with. So what we actually have here is we have a couple of corpuses within this. Uh, for the corpus within this example, it is literally just a, a PDF of the transcription. It's the same thing as the TXT. And if we go to the edge of darkness, that's the other transcription that I pulled from YouTube. It's just a transcript. Again, I took it, copy, paste, and put in a, a TXT file, then converted that to a PDF. But this way you can get a sense of well, how we convert it. Um, so easiest thing, if you have a whole collection of PDFs, what I like to do is I like to have it scan the working directory and grab all those PDFs. So make sure if, it's, if you have stuff you don't want to pull within this, you want to remove it out. So what we do is we're looking for a list of files. And we say everything that's a PDF, put that into a list. So now we have a list. And if we do files here, there's our two PDFs. We have the Edge of Darkness transcript and the Crystal Palace transcript. That's exactly what we want. So I'm going to go ahead and do an LPI, and I'm just going to go ahead and put those in there. So now I have something called CLC or Call of Cthulhu. And so we've cre we started creating a corpus now. We have two transcripts. One is from Edge of Darkness transcription, and the other is the Crystal Pal Shadows of the Crystal Palace. So if we go ahead and look at this, I can then go ahead and print out the entire, the entire transcript and with the line breaks. Whenever you see the slash N, that's going to be a line break within the text. So, I mean, there's the YouTube link. If you're interested in Edge of Darkness, that's a fun one too. Um, we can kind of print that and see, okay, well, what is the first item within, within this? And we have our Edge of Darkness. So we can print that out and there's our entire transcript for Edge of Darkness. If we did COC, we wanted two. Well, there's the entire transcript for Shadows of the Crystal Palace. Um, these are fairly lengthy. Each of these are a couple hours long. So once we have that, what we can then do is we're going to create and turn this to, into a corpus to make it easier to work with. Um, so we're going to go ahead and put this in. We're just going to essentially reformat it. And once we've done that, we're going to make sure it's loaded properly. So now we have our CLC list and we have our corpus here. The nice thing with the corpus is it's going to start giving you some metadata that we can then add in there too. And we're going to update this metadata because looking at this, it's saying I'm the author. I am not. I wish I was, but I am not. 
uh, we're going to update this. That way, when we have the metadata, we can then actually run some additional stuff with that and report that. So when we look at the, ins when we inspect the corpus document of the Call of Cthulhu sessions, we can see, okay, well, it's in there. There's a lot of characters. I mean, it's, um, Shadows of the Crystal Palace is almost twice as long as the video. It's like four hours long. It's great, but it's a long view. So we expect to see more characters within there. Um, but essentially, this metadata, this is useless. It is completely me meaningless because I didn't have any metadata attached to it. It used the metadata based from Microsoft. So what we're going to do is we're going to fix this. When we look at the meta here. It says uh, I'm the author. It gives the ID. But I'm like, okay, that's not right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use Dublin Core, and I'm going to go ahead and say for the metadata for the first one, the author is Becca Scott. That is the Keeper of Arcane Lore, or the session leader. And the Keeper of Arcane Lore for Shadows of Crystal Palace is Talos and Jaffe. So I'm going to add them as the creators. And I'm going to go ahead and change the title. So it's actually the title of the session rather than the PDF within this. So I'm just adding to the metadata. That way I can save it and have a nice archived version of this. So now if I look at the first one, well, now we have the correct author. I can also then go ahead and if I want to change the time, actually the timestamp, that looks pretty good. It was actually done earlier. This is just when I pulled it and created the file, but we can then go ahead and change that as well. And then there's our metadata for our corpus for our second transcription, Shadows of the Crystal Palace. So right now we're just processing the data. We're getting it into a corpus file so then we can actually then start cleaning it and start making sense of it. Um, we're going to do that and we're going to do the same process with the critical role Twitter X data. Um, so it's going to be the same process, some different codings within this, but effectively it's going to be the same thing. Just two different uh, file types to work with. So call it Cthulhu. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and we'll start processing this. But before we do that, I want to take a quick pause and see um, any questions so far on how I've added in the data or any, any questions so far before we start processing it. I have a, I have a request. Sure. Uh, at some point, if you're able to visualize something that you've shown us, can you do that? Um, what do you mean by visualize? Something I've shown you. Um, show this in graphs or charts or some type of visualization. Oh, is um, there is there an appropriate? Oh, there. Okay. There. Yeah, I've, I've done a couple, and I'm be doing some more in a little bit too. All right. Thank you. Yep. No problem. Uh, so we'll be definitely looking at some in terms of sentiment analysis, and then um, some of the Twitter data will also create in some uh, some graphs as well. Great question. Um, and then if you start running out of time, uh, I'm going to make sure I go ahead and skip ahead to those. That way we cover those too. Um, right now, we're just going to go ahead and just do some processing. So again, we want to take our time, read through this first, make sure it makes sense before we start just kind of running algorithms on it. Um, so now we're going to go ahead and take a quick glimpse at it just to make sure, like, let's say we I, walk, I cleaned this and looked at it and then walked away. Well, I'd want to go ahead and just kind of review it just to make sure there's anything within this. It's just a quick check of the first couple of lines. Again, this is going to be an issue because I have to manually, I could potentially manually remove this or I can create some code to then remove each of the speaker's names, which I'll walk you how to do and how to fix that. So processing text. Um, yeah, it's going to be multiple steps approaches, um, but it is critical. So we need to transform the data. We need to convert text to lower cases. We're going to remove any numbers, any punctuations. We're going to remove stop words. We're going to also do some stemming for the words. So if it was like um, clean, cleaning, cleaned, we would stem those to be clean. We'd also want to uh, identify any sort of synonyms and kind of group those together as well. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and we'll do some uh, cleaning within that. The first thing is we're going to use get transformations. And that gives you, well, what are some transformations that you can use? So we can remove numbers, we can remove words, uh, punctuation, we can stem the document, and we remove white space. We're actually going to do all of these at different levels within this. Um, the idea is when we do this, we could do this on a specific part of the corpus, or we can do this for the entire corpus. So if we use the tm map function, 
when we then do these transformations, it's going to do all documents within a corpus. So let's say I had 10 or 15 call Cthulhu sessions, and I want to do all this process on each one, on all of them together, rather than individually, I could use the TM map and call it a day. I'd still want to review all 15 of them um, in isolation, but it's kind of a way to speed things up. If you're doing this each one separately, it's going to be a little more time intensive, but it really kind of depends what you're trying to do. Um, there are some other transformations you can use as well. I'm going to show you some cool things you can do too that we can then wrap within a TM map. Uh, so for example, we have a, a content transformer and we're going to wrap a function in the pattern. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to go ahead in like the two space, we're going to remove unwanted symbols. So this is going to be we're going to use that two space. We're using this thing. Okay, within this pattern, if there's any sp additional spaces in here, we're going to go ahead and get rid of them. So it's going to go through that, detect that pattern, and then apply it. So for here, we're going to go ahead and do that to, for the two space within this and remove any want unwanted symbols. So that's the slash, the at symbol, backspaces, so two space, we're just kind of changing that to a space. We're getting rid of those, which is great. Um, so if we take a look over here and they kind of do an inspection just to make sure it cleaned out everything. Um, so always, as you're doing the cleaning, check out at each iteration, make sure it actually did what you think it, it was doing. There's been an instance where I was trying to clean stuff and it said, oh, it ran. And I look at it, I'm like, no, no, you didn't. Um, so it's always good to check this out. We're also going to remove everything to a lowercase. That's to make it easier, especially if you're trying to have it scan for specific keywords, which we'll do in a little bit too. Um, so in a map on our entire Call of Cthulhu corpus, we're going to use the content transformer of changing everything that might be uppercase to all lowercase. That way it's all consistent. And then if we look at our, if we inspect our corpus here, we'll do Corpus 2, Shadows of the Crystal Palace. Everything is now lowercase. And that's great. Because that's going to make it easier to pull because it is cap sensitive within R. So now we've done that. Now we get to have the fun and remove all that speaker information. So what we're doing now is we're going to use our content transformer. And we're going to say every time you see Talison, replace with nothing. We're just essentially removing and dropping these specific names because of the way the data was configured as part of the transcription. We're just dropping all that. So we're dropping Travis, Marisha, Erica, Phil, Ashley, and Liam. We're also going to remove this colon here. I could have put this around here as well, but I also wanted to put any instance where another player says another player's name. Maybe I want to remove that. So I'm just removing all of those, and I'm going to inspect it again. So I went ahead and did that, and now if you look at it, so I'm inspecting it. So actually now I'm not seeing the speaker's names, which is great. Um, if I see here, I see these two hyph these two dashes. I could maybe go back up to where we had here and I could add in this. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And then if I scroll over, so maybe I need to do space, space. So you kind of have to play around with it and it's gonna be this iterative fashion. And, Make sure you take lots of notes for yourself as well. Um, but that's kind of the process so that we can then do for removing those specific things that we saw on that scan. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and convert everything to, oops, let me go back down. So we have that. Great. Um, if we had numbers, um, we then want to remove any numerical values. Because this is a tabletop game that uses uh, polyhedral dice, as part of the game, we actually want to keep that in there. But let's say we want to, if there's numbers in there we wanted to remove, like let's say there was like page numbers like that, we'd want to then go ahead and remove that. Right now it's commented out. We're also going to now take any sort of punctuation, like exclamation points, um, anything like that for punctuation, we're going to strip that out as well because we just want the text. So as we look over, now we can see all that punctuation has gone as well. So we're getting there. We're definitely getting there. Um, the next thing we're going to do is we have to remove what's called stop words. So stop words are common words found in the language. Um, so for, very, and, of, are, and the list goes on. But these are words, for, it's, when we run a sentiment analysis or topic modeling, it's just going to be filler. So we need to strip all those out.
So it's going to go ahead and we're going to remove the stop words. We're going to be using the English one as well within this. And seeing, okay, so we have set stairs, post, guards. So we're starting to kind of strip away some of this information that's kind of meaningless and getting to what we really want. If we wanted to, we can also list the stop words we've listed and kind of delete it. So I'm going to go and look at this. And then these are all of the stop words that were within this that we would be removed. Um, we just kind of want to get a sense of like, well, maybe some of these shouldn't be added, so we can add them back in. But just to get an idea of, well, what was removed within this. Uh, next thing, we have additional white space within this. So we have additional spaces. We have, you can kind of see it's kind of all, the spacing is all over the place. Again, I copied this copy paste from YouTube, so I'm not surprised. So we're just going to strip all that extra white space. That way it's going to be consistent within this. And that looks so much better. Um, I'm just doing this on the entire corpus, but I'm just looking at the first, inspecting the first or the second corpus for now. Uh, if I wanted to change that and look at edge of darkness, same process. So now that we've stripped the white space, we've done, we moved punctuation, we moved stop words, we've cleaned it up a bit more. Now I do stemming, and that's going to remove uh, common word endings such as e s e d s pluralized. We're removing those and we're stemming them. Um, and then we're actually going to go ahead and start making uh, some fun stuff within this. So we're going to be using the snowball package. We're going to take our corpus, and we're just going to go ahead and say, okay, stem all these. And as we can see, okay, well, it's getting a little bit, like if we try to read this, it's going to read clunky. Um, so it's, you wouldn't want to read it per se, so you want to read the raw text, but just to get a sense of what it's doing there. Um, now that we've cleaned it, we're going to turn this into what's called a document term matrix. So this is, uh, think of it as it's a matrix with a collection of, so of all the documents with one row for each document and each column is going to be a term. So if we had a, like, um, let me see an example. So this would be our Shots Crystal Pals and rather than the entire text, it's going to be good. The next column is going to be evening column, children, next column, welcome, next column, call, next column, Cthulhu. So it's going to be a document term matrix with that type of setup. So again, each document is going to be a row, and each column is going to be a new term, or each term. And then we're also going to have the, the values within that matrix is typically going to be the word count. So we're going to take that and we're going to see what that looks like. So we just going to give you kind of what's the sparsity of this. But if we look at it, um, just trying to go ahead and pull this up so you can see. Integers, dimensions, names. So we have, oh, here we go, there's the terms. So we have our terms within this, and then we also have the counts for the terms as well within it. So we can then start seeing, okay, well, what is in there, what it's seeing within both documents. From there, let me go ahead and just kind of see inspect a fraction. So we have the term uh, comfort. In the edge of darkness, that was twice in there. Shouts for spouse, comfort was once. We have a community. It's kind of stemmed a little bit. Edge of Darkness was three times. Shadows of Crystal Palace was zero. So we can kind of get a sense of what that matrix looks like. We wouldn't look at the entire matrix as a lot, given how big these files are, but just kind of what it's doing now. So we're gonna uh, now we can then obtain the term frequencies as a vector. So we're converting our document term matrix into a matrix and summing the column counts. What does that mean? Well, we're going to find out. So we're taking this and we're saying, okay, within this, our frequency, What's the the frequency for all these kind of summing it? Um, we can then also order this. So we're going to order our frequencies. What's the most frequent terms? And what's the least frequent terms? Now that we've ordered it, let's go ahead and show this. So we have our 1910s. We have 18, the years. So these are all the kind of the years. Let's go ahead and take a look at, go ahead and print this out. So we have the frequency for all the different ones. We have behind was 56. Uh, behavior was used once within this. 
And this was, which one was this? Oh, these are all together combined. So we get a sense of like how frequent these are. We can also then kind of look at, show the most frequent ones too. So we can see, okay, well, what this looks like. We can see the lowest. So we're just getting a sense of what the terms we used, how little, how many within it. From this, we can then look at the associations of words. So looking at a the correlations between words, how frequently one was used with another. Uh, so we use quickly uh, specifically um, the word shadow, and we see well what was related to shadow, and we can then kind of see okay well what what words were used within this, and it's mostly like kind of looking at it, uh, yeah. So that's gonna be kind of let me clean this up a little bit. Um, so we're going to specify the correlation limit of 0.6. We can kind of change that. Let's say we wanted to do 0.8 and kind of see what that looks like. Um, from there, we can then, let's go ahead and we're going to do some plotting now. So from this, we're going to take our word frequencies. Now we're actually going to say, okay, well, this is a lot of data. Let's create a visual to make better understand this. So I'm going to sort our columns for the matrix. I'm going to go ahead and once I do that, I can see, okay, what were the words the most frequently used? I'm going to turn this into a data frame. This is just the first 20 that we have. I'm going to turn it to a data frame here. And then I'll see what this looks like. If I look at our WF data frame, here is our word and our frequency for all the different words here. So cat was used 85 times. We have actual was 72. Uh, Egyptian, 56. Um, I don't want to spoil it, but if you get a chance to, for watching Crystal Palace, it's, the word cat is going to make complete sense once you start watching it. Uh, it's lots of fun. So now that we've created this and put it into a format with frequency, or essentially a frequency table to a degree, we can then take this and put this into a word cloud. So we're going to go ahead. Um, it's a question about a question about the uh, the word correlation mean. Um, I would have to double check on that. Um, offhand, I'm I'd have to do some double checking on that. Um, so feel free to send me an email, and I can double check and get back to you. I'm not. I'd have to look up specifically the word cor for the word correlation for the interpretations of that. Um, so I don't want to give any bad information on that. Um, so for the word cloud, what I'm going to do is we're going to go ahead and use the word frequencies and turn this into a word cloud. So we're taking our frequency data frame. Minimum frequency has to have at least 50, so we're not going to get all these little ones in there. And we use dark two within this. So there's different uh, color brews you can use. This was done a quick one that I kind of liked. We can see, OK, well, what, what words would be most commonly used? The bigger the word, the more frequently it was used. So if we kind of look here, um, we can see there's uh, behind, uh, sanity, uh, glass, back, laughter, shadow. Get a sense of what that what that kind of looks like in there. Um, so this is a really good idea of like kind of what what terms are we most commonly seeing within our text. Uh, from there, and um, so this is a where I got the code based off of sentiment analysis. Um, before I move on, I also want to mention too, there is a, if you type in R for tidy text, there is, and I'll go ahead and let me put this within the chat. This is a fantastic free resource. So this is using um, the tidy framework in R to do sentiment analysis, uh, word clouds, and all that fun stuff. And actually, word. Oh, cool. Um, I did not know I could do something like this. So this is networks. OK. Um, I don't have this within the code, but oh, so it's going to be related to correlations. Um, just wanted to circle back on a question with the, that I had in the chat. Um, I'll do some more digging with, oh, here we go, word of coordinates, there it is. 
Uh, so for the correlations, commonly used words together within titles or keywords within this. Um, so acronyms. Yeah, let me save this and then uh, try to follow up with the specific question about the correlations. Um, then we're going to pull that up while it's still fresh in my memory. Um, so what we're going to do now for sentiment analysis is we're going to see, looking at our document term matrix, we're going to reform that into a tidy format. And then we're going to see what, what was the positive, how positive each one was, how negative, in kind of different levels within this. So we're converting this to tidy. And there's different lexicons you can use. So we're using the NRC lexicon. So these are going to be kind of different, essentially libraries that you can use for like positive, negative valence, and some different levels within that. Um, if you go ahead and Google search uh, lexicons within this, you can then get a sense of the different variations within this. So we're going to go ahead and use an inner join for, based on the term for the word, since we're using it at the word level. And we're going to see, okay, what are the sentiments within this? So we have the term, and then we have the sentiment. So let me go ahead and make this a little bit easier to read. So we have the document, specific term, and then how many times it was used. So edge of darkness, we have a chord, which was a positive sentiment, but it's also a trust sentiment. So the NRC has this kind of breakdown of the different sentiments. We have sadness, surprise, negative, fear. Uh, so depending on what you want to look at, there'll be different variations, different breakdowns that it's using in terms of how it parses out and categorizes these terms. Uh, but we get a sense of kind of what this looks like. Um, so what we've done is we've taken our document term matrix and we've essentially added the accounts and then put like, what would the assigned sentiment for that specific term look like? We've done that for all, all the words within the document term matrix. We're going to index this as a factor. And then we're going to then do the count, in, or the count by index and sentiment. So what we're doing is we're processing the data. And then we're going to go ahead and spread the results. Now, when we have this index, just so you get a sense, now we've processed the data. So before it looked like this. Now we have it as our first, we have our document. And now each of these, these are different sentiments using the NRC lexicon. And how many times there was a word that kind of fell within each of these. So we've kind of, we've partitioned it. We've essentially aggregated up to the sentiment level. From there, what we can then do is we're going to go ahead and use a polarity score and determine, well, is it mostly positive? Is it mostly negative? So now we have that. So we have our polarity. Uh, Call of Cthulhu, it is a dark game. Your characters typically die or go crazy. So we'd expect to see negative within this. It, it's not going to be a happy game. So seeing negative, I am not surprised at all. Fear, disgust, negative, sadness, surprise. I Those are all things I think of Call of Cthulhu that jives, that completely matches. So when we take a look at this, we can see the specific document. And then for each of our different sentiment categories, what were the counts within this, as well as what's our overall polarity score. Um, comparatively, Edge of Darkness was less negative than Shadows of Crystal Palace. Um, also, not surprised. Uh, they have different flavors of the session, so not surprised at all. Now to visualize this, what we need to do is we need to do what's called a melt. So we need to take our index here, which is in wide format, and then we need to turn this and flip it or transpose it so it's going to be essentially in wide format. So when we do that, I'm going to go ahead and use the V-shape package, and we're going to melt it. So when we melt, let me go ahead and pull the index long up just so you can kind of see what this looks like. So when we melt, we have each of our documents, but now we have another one that's just our variable. So these, the variable is actually our sentiment category for each one, and then what's the value. So for Edge of Darkness, Anger, that category, 72 occurrences. Shadows Crystal Palace was 84 occurrences. And we do that for each of our different categories. Now then, once we've had this and we've categorized this and put this into a long format, now we can actually make a visual for it. So we're going to pipe our index long. That's our sentiment analysis and overall polarity. We're going to pipe that in. Our X is going to be our variable. That's our sentiment. Y is going to be the value of the numerical, so kind of which 
what are the counts? And then the fill is going to be the doc. So we're going to have two different documents within this. And then making some basic changes. So when we run this, this is what we get. We have anger. That's the first two. We can see a side-by-side -side comparison of Edge of Darkness compared to Shadows of the Crystal Palace. We can see for anger, well, Shadows was a little bit higher for anger. Anticipation. So across each of these, Shadows did have more frequency within this. Um, the polarity, though, much more negative for Shadows of the Crystal Palace. It was much, It's much darker, which is great. But also if you look at Trust, they're about the same. Edge Darkness has a little bit more of the trust thing going on, but not by a whole lot. But this is how we can then compare sentiments across multiple documents. This is useful if you have different works of um, different writers, or different works of the same writer, or maybe um, a different work by different writers that you're kind of comparing the themes, maybe it's different speeches. So this is a really good way to kind of get a sense of what the sentiment is by these different factors, by these different categories. Then tiered a quick visual because that table is really great, but this is probably what you want to include within like a manuscript or within like a PowerPoint presentation. Um, so once we have that, then we can then go ahead and do some topic modeling. Um, as I mentioned at the start of this, um, please use caution with topic modeling. This we're going to use an algorithm and have it decide what the underlying topic is for us, and it's gonna we're gonna have to make sense of it. It's if you want to take this from a more qualitative approach and then code this qualitatively, that's going to leverage you as a researcher, your knowledge, your expertise, sense of literature, sense of different theory. The algorithm doesn't have any of that for you. So kind of you got to choose what you're going to do. So when we do text mining, and here's a great example that kind of walks through this. So make sure I have the hyperlinks in here. Um, we're going to go ahead and set a seed. We want this to make sure it's predictable. So if we run this code again, it's not going to be changing it. So we need to set a seed for reproducibility. We're going to put our document to our matrix. We're going to go ahead and set this. And we're going to go ahead and try running it with two topics. We can also change this to five. I'm just taking a guess with two topics for now. And then I'm going to go ahead and get the matrix here. So a beta is essentially the, going to be the probability for which topic, topic one versus topic two. So I'm going to go ahead and pipe this and group by it, and then let's try to make sense of what we see here. And now what I'm going to do is we're going to go ahead and rearrange just to create a visual of well, what these topics look like. So within our topic two, topic one, these are the words that we're seeing within topic one. Can, yeah, just, no, see, okay, right, well, look like. Whereas topic two... Most commonly, it's just and then get. And so now we're trying to make sense of what these topics look like. Uh, for me, this is kind of hard to kind of figure out well, what's the difference between these two topics. Um, we can also see, well, what is the greatest difference within this using a log ratio? So we're going to use the, the, um, the topic modeling within this and see, OK, well, what's going to give us the biggest difference? That'll be more potentially more helpful. So we're going to take our topic model, we're going to pipe it, and we're going to put this through to create a log ratio to figure out, okay, well, what's going to help us differentiate between these? And now we can kind of see, okay, well, where, what are we seeing? We can start inspecting these because this is going to go on for um, 276 rows. But then we can kind of see, well, what this looks like in terms of what's going to give us the greatest difference between those two topics. Um, if we turn a better way to do this, though, which would be create a visual. So we're going to go ahead and do this by direction within this, taking our log ratio we calculated before, and going to go ahead and turn this into a visual here. So we can kind of see, okay, well, what is the log, what's going to give us the biggest difference between topic two and topic one? We can kind of start seeing like a hope, push, fair, arcade, entrance, uh, die, walk, god, pull. And kind of start getting a sense of, okay, what's going on here? Um, and that's how we can then start, that's some basic parts of topic modeling and going from there. Um, for time, so we have 15 minutes. I'm going to show you how to do some some Twitter data and how to how to essentially clean that up. Um, but the, uh, this, we're taking the same approaches as we did within the Call of Cthulhu work. 
Um, this was me a little bit different. There'll be some different add-ons I'm going to do in terms of like looking at well locations and stuff like that. Stuff that Twitter or X has made it more difficult and challenging to get without paying for it. Um, before we go on to Twitter data, I wanted to do a quick check-in um, and see if there's any questions so far, or if there's um, any comments. So just want to take a quick pause. Um, and then, so if there's a question I'm not quite sure of on the spot, um, I'll, I'll follow up. I'm going to go ahead and let me, just going to make sure I save the chat. And then what I'll do is, um, if it's something I'm not quite sure of, I'll do some checking and I'll follow up with you if that sounds great. Uh, just, let me, uh, just let me know if you have, a, if you send me any direct messages they want me to follow up on, uh, just say email's fine and in the next couple of days I'll get back to you. Um, so again, I don't want to give you bad information off the top of my head. I need to double check it. Um, so we're going to move on to some Twitter data. So this was uh, 726 data uh, tweets I pulled from X back when it was Twitter. And I had used Critical Role as the hashtag and pulled that. It's a bunch of voice actors playing Dungeons and Dragons. Um, so this was archival data that I had from last time I ran this workshop in 2022. The downside is it can no longer scrape to tweets freely. Uh, same methods I used in the past, they no longer work because they've they essentially dismantled the API and turned it into a paid option. Um, so I'm not able to walk you through how I would go about doing that. I believe, don't quote me, and I'm kind of hesitant on saying this as I'm recording it, but you could potentially use NVivo. And there's an end capture option in NVivo, and I think you might be able to potentially scrape it using that. I haven't tried it. I don't use NVivo, but that could be a workaround. Um, it's going to be a trial and error type thing. Uh, but I wanted to mention that in passing, uh, worst case scenario. So because this is archival, I'm going to go ahead and load the data set I already had scraped. And that's just a critical role data. And if I click on that, it's a data frame that has the user ID, the status, when it's created, um, the name, the screen name, the actual text of the tweet, the source. So this is all from an iPhone. We have tweet deck, we have Android. We have replies, was it quoted, was it favorited? Um, favorite count, hashtags, if there's an additional URL. So you used, to, you used to be able to get a lot of information. If there was media, you can go ahead and pull that too. Um, so a whole lot of data. Um, you can also keep on going. There's the number of followers. You have quote descriptions. So back when you used to pull this freely, it was easy. Um, location, this person is located currently in a, a black hole. Awesome. That's cool. You don't see that every day. But we can then go ahead and we can, we would be able to scrape this and then make sense of it. Um, apologies again. I was hoping to be able to do some new data pulling this, but X was not, I couldn't work my magic with this. So what I'm going to do first is take a quick peek at the data set and just seeing, okay, if it characters, is it numeric data and so forth. Um, this is all looking great so far. Uh, feel free to play around with this data. Um, I have some additional archival Twitter data if you're interested. It's a lot of it's like gaming stuff when I play around with it just because it's fun just me, but that's it. I'm happy to share with what I can. Um, so what I do now is, uh, let's, let's say that you were looking at tweets and you wanted to have it scan and apply a code. So, um, let's say that I wanted to know like how often the character Chetney is talked about. So one of the characters on the campaign or the D and D session is named Chetney, uh, blood hunter gnome. Um, so I, yeah, I watched it all the time. Um, but I wanted to then scan and figure out, okay, well, how many times is Chetney talked about? So I can use Grapple, and I'm going to say Chetney, and within the text, so within this actual tweet, how many times is Chetney coming up? So we out of this, 17 times Chetney was mentioned. And then the rest of the main remaining ones for the data, Chetney was not mentioned. So we see 17 tweets talking about the character Chetney. Awesome. Now, let's say I wanted to scan the data and I want to know well, how often, I like, essentially create a code where it's going to scan all the tweets. And if this keyword, if Chetney is in that text, give it a one. Otherwise, give it a zero. So you can use like if this was speech, how many times 
each of these are being used. If it was this and this other word, you can then I take this if else function and make it more complex. So it's actually a series of codings. So for now, I'm going to go ahead and create a new variable called chutney. And if the tweet contained anything, the word chutney in there, it's going to give it a one, otherwise a zero. So here's our chutney comments. So this tweet had a chutney. The rest of these are zero, more zeros. Oh, here's a chutney one. So I can actually then get a sense of well, what those look like. Now that we've created that coding, that dummy code, I would just go ahead and I would double check, make sure this matches with up here before those numbers match. So I know my code worked and I can then say, okay, well, what's the context? What was the context of the word chutney? So what we can then do is we can look at, well, what were the tweets about chutney? So we're going to subset data for only those tweets that have chutney based on our search. So we're using our dummy coded variable. I'm subsetting this. And then I want to take a look at well, what those 17 tweets look like. So this was Chetney was so offended. Chetney's excited. Or um, it began slashed half to... So, yeah, it gets a little weird, but um, we can get a sense of well, how Chetney is being used. So this is really important to go, okay, what was the context of these specific keywords? And you can do that for any sort. Like if that's what I wanted to look at, Pop-Tarts. Someone's talking about Pop-Tarts. Okay, well, I don't understand that, but let's we can do that same idea. So you can actually create a whole series of keyword searches and then look at what was the context of those specific words and how they were utilized. Um, and that'd be much more informative rather than using like a kind of maybe a text or a topic modeling. If you have lots of data though, it's gonna take some time. But then from this, we can also look at, well, what was the most liked tweets? So we have our favorite comment, or what's our favorite counts? We're gonna arrange them, see, so, okay, from these, we can then see, okay, well, what was the favorite? So we have the screen names of the favorite ones. What was the most favorited tweets? So it was the first one about a ship that is from the second campaign of Critical Role. Uh, so this is from the first one. We have Slayer's Take. We have a bunch of stuff from the show. And these were the ones that people favorited the most. We can then also pull the location of the tweets. So because there's a column in the data that has um, the location of the individual, we can then figure, okay, well, where they're located from. So we're gonna pull in that location and then figure, okay, well, where they're located and create a, a quick visual. So we're gonna go ahead and do this and we're just doing a quick bar chart. So these were the number of tweets. So we had about, almost a almost hundred from Minnesota, a bunch from Spain. And these could be the same individuals tweeting from the same location. Like we have drifting. So it's probably gonna be the same individual multiple, multiple times. So they're probably a highly active user. Um, we have so, somewhere the Navy uh, puts me. So we can get a sense of, well, who these, um, where these are, the critical role tweet users, for unique locations, well, where they are. Um, we can also pull embedded data from this. So, we're going to go say that if they have a full name place, we're going to go ahead and slice that and get the frequency. So there's also metadata outside of the tweet and outside of this that you can pull out location. Uh, this was back before they dismantled the API. So this is going to be a little bit more challenging. But with archival stuff, we can actually get the, the place where they tweeted from. Um, so word of caution, social media. There's a lot of your data out there. And a lot of that is... You can get it, and you can take a look at see some of the stuff, some of the stuff here. So just be cautious. Um, can export uh, this data out. I uh, so mean, in terms of the the raw Twitter data out of R, or do you mean the this visual or this um this frequency table of data? I'm assuming it's the entire data set. Um, so if you wanted to do that, um, you can. What you would do is. I'm going to go ahead and type out the, the line here. So it would be write.csv. I'm going to say the uh, crit is going to be the name of the object. And I'm going to call this uh, test output.csv. I'm going to go ahead and run that. CSV test output. CSV. 
let's see. There we go. So there's the data. Um, so to export it, yeah. So let me go ahead and try that and then see. Skip test output there. Um, get an error message. I have to play around with it. Um, oh, it's, I see what's going on. Um, it is possible the, uh, if you're trying to put that out of um, the export out of the data, I would ask kind of why you would export it out and what are you going to be using the exported data with? If it's for a different program, it's probably easier to read it in. Um, it is row dot names equals false. Uh, so I'd have to figure out the element of code because it's giving me an error message. Um, I have exported data out within it. I just haven't exported Twitter data out. It's, um, you know, let me try something really quick. Uh, so C2 um, as data.frame crit. So I'm going to force it into a different object location. Do, do, do. Um, code element. Let me take a quick peek at this error message. Ah, okay, so um, what's going on here is it, I just need to change it around here. So, so crit df, and then, so I decided to change it because it's a character. And there we go. And let me just check this. Test output. There we go. There's all the data. So, yep, uh, so if you wanted to do that, if you wanted to export this Twitter data out, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put the code into the chat. So you'd have to apply this as a character. That way it's going to go ahead and put it in the correct application. Otherwise, you're going to get this error message that we're seeing right now for the encode element. So you'd apply that, and then you can write it as a CSV file, and then you can go ahead and do with what you need to do. Uh, so that would probably be the easiest method. Um, so I hadn't seen the error message within that, but... Uh, and Cypher kind of um, being a pause, trying to figure that out. But I want to make sure I was able to answer that really quick. Um, so what we can then do, kind of going back with location, we can go then go ahead and do a quick box plot. Oops, I went ahead and there we go. So we can then kind of take a quick visualization of these unique locations. Now, there's only a couple of them that have this metadata in here. So it's going to be a little bit different. We can then get our most liked tweets. Kind of see what that looked like, just like we did before. Look at who the top tweeters. Um, so we can kind of see what that is. And then we can then go ahead and start the reformatting. Uh, for time, I'm going to go through this really quick. Um, this is a little bit different than we saw with the Call of Cthulhu. I'm putting it within a mutate statement. So it's the same thing, just different functions. Removing uh, uh, ampersands and other aspects. Uh, we're removing all these kind of different aspects, we're adding stop words. This is gonna be a quick one pass through. And then with long stop words within this, it's detecting any sort of strings or special characters. So this is rather than the broken down code with the call Cthulhu, this is all just a single pass. So we're gonna filter that out. We're gonna then add retweet, HTTPS and bot. To, we don't want those in our stop word list. We don't want that as uh, data we're gonna then visualize. We can then do an anti-join to further remove these. So we're just cleaning out, we're getting rid of anything with bot, HTTPS, um, any of those things. So now we have a cleaned, once so we have a gold, nine, go, sings, dead. Uh, we can also just manually. So here's kind of how we can then go about removing retweets, removing usernames, removing links. Uh, leading, lagging blanks. So these are all the same things as above, but just a more manual approach. It'll give you the same thing. Um, from there, then we can take our cleaned one and do a word cloud. We're going to first get the word frequencies. 
So we have love, time, Laudna, Imogen, episode, Matt, campaign. We're going to pipe that through into a word cloud and create a quick visual. And there we go. So, I mean, we probably want to rescale this. We can see love is a big factor of these tweets within this. And that's pretty cool. We might want to delve into that, see what's going on. Uh, and then we can do uh, different sentiment analysis. So we use the NRC that we did before. Uh, you're going to get a little loading thing saying you need a, the corresponding. And just click on yes when you see that and you're good to go. Um, but we have the word, the sentiment, just like we did with Call of Cthulhu. We're just going to go ahead and filter that. This is just a different way of doing it in terms of piping it through rather than the coding. Same thing. It doesn't really matter. But we have all of our data. We have this. If we go all the way to the right, so we keep on going. There's 92 columns. You know what? Let me do it this way. So our raw data, and then if we go all the way over here to the right-hand side, we have the sentiment, positive, anger, disgust. So went ahead and start coding some stuff in there. Um, we can then make a visual for each frequency of each sentiment. So we're going to go ahead and pipe our cleaned uh, critical role tweet data in here. And we can see, well, number of occurrences, how many tweets were anger, how many times anger was listed, it was over a thousand times. Um, negative, almost three point or thirty five hundred times. Um, trust. So we can kind of see well how positive or negative and different sentiments of this Twitter data was. We can then do topic modeling. Um, so we can then pipe this in, turn it into a corpus, just like we did Call of Cthulhu, where we move some stop words here. We're just retransforming it, removing numbers, removing uh, stemming the words. Um, removing any stemmed associations, getting the lengths, and then setting a seed. But what with 10 topics, because I don't know how many are in here. And then I'm going to do four different methods of topic modeling. So we're going to do the VM, the fixed, uh, classical, and we're going to do Bayesian Gibbs. And that takes a little while for it to run. And then we just apply this into our topics and kind of see what those different topics look like. Um, so I probably could have just scratched the entire part for the Twitter here because this is probably a fire hose of information. Uh, my apologies. I'd, I'd rather have you have more stuff and more tools for your tool belt, so to speak, and then not enough. Um, so yeah, um, while that's running, uh, let me know if you have any questions. Um, I also want to be mindful of time because we're going to be ending in about two minutes. Oh, there we go, in two minutes. So if you have questions, let me know. And um, I can follow up with stuff too. Uh, so we're going to head apply this to our models. And I can see, well, what's topic one? Critical role, Halloween. Uh, topic two, Rudis, Moon. That's a really cool follow the thing. So we then what we can do then do is we take our topics. And these are by different types of doing this. We have our VEM, we have our CTT, we have our, our Gibbs sampling. So we, we take a look at the 10 words of each in, in each topic and we're like, okay, well, what is this topic? What would, looking at these different words, what is the underlying topic that we're seeing from this and kind of making it sense that way. So think of it almost like if you're using like a factor analysis that we're looking at the items and making sense of, well, what items to factor, what is that factor and kind of giving it a name. It's going to be the same idea. Um, and then we go do that and then we can look at assignments and then that was assigned. Um, but yeah, there, again, this was kind of a fire hose of information. Um, there's a bunch of resources. Um, let's see, question. Uh, so the re uh, the recording will probably be available in like a week or two. Um, if you can, just uh, go ahead and send me an email. And I'll go ahead and put my email in the chat. Uh, send me an email that you like the recording. And then as soon as it becomes available, I'll send you the link as well as the um, the tiny URL that has all of the um, all the code, all the data that we use today. That way you have everything and you can kind of play around with it, uh, make changes to it. Uh, you're not going to really break it at all. And just try the different things and have fun with it. Um, yeah, so just uh, I hope this was helpful. I know my apologies. I know this is probably like a fire hose of information. Um, 
again, I'm not an expert in text mining. I know kind of the basics of it. I can I can do some basic stuff with it. Um, but if there's specific questions you have on it, uh, send me an email. Let me know. Um, I know there's a question about the the correlation in terms of the items. I'm going to follow up as a separate in a separate email on that one because I want to make sure I follow up on that. But if you have the questions, uh, let me know and I'll, I'll do my best. And if I can't figure it out, I'll try to give you resources and go from there. But thank you all so much for joining and for letting me talk about Call of Cthulhu and Dungeons and Dragons. I love talking about that stuff. Um, but I hope you all have a great rest of the day and just thank you so much.